What's the matter? she asked. The engineer turned, astonished. Her question had sounded like an order, not like the amateur curiosity of a passenger. She stood hands in pockets, coat collar raised, the wind beating her hair in strands across her face. Red light, lady, he said, pointing up with his thumb. How long has it been on? An hour. We're off the main track, aren't we? That's right. Why? I don't know. The conductor spoke up. I don't think we had any business being sent off on a siding. That switch wasn't working right, and this thing's not working at all. He jerked his head up at the red light. I don't think the signal's going to change. I think it's busted. Then what are you doing? Waiting for it to change? In her pause of startled anger, the fireman chuckled. Last week the crack special of the Atlantic Southern got left on a siding for two hours. Just somebody's mistake. This is the Taggart Comet, she said. The comet has never been late. She's the only one in the country that hasn't, said the engineer. There's always a first time, said the fireman. You don't know about railroads, lady, said a passenger. There's not a signal system or a dispatcher in the country that's worth a damn. She did not turn or notice him, but spoke to the engineer. If you know that the signal is broken, what do you intend to do? He did not like her tone of authority, and he could not understand why she assumed it so naturally. She looked like a young girl. Only her mouth and eyes showed that she was a woman in her thirties. The dark gray eyes were direct and disturbing, as if they cut through things, throwing the inconsequential out of the way. The face seemed faintly familiar to him, but he could not recall where he had seen it. Lady, I don't intend to stick my neck out, he said. He means, said the fireman, that our job's to wait for orders. Your job is to run this train, not against a red light. If the light says stop, we stop. A red light means danger, lady, said the passenger. We're not taking any chances, said the engineer. Whoever's responsible for it, he'll switch the blame to us if we move, so we're not moving till somebody tells us to. And if nobody does? Somebody will turn up sooner or later. How long do you propose to wait? The engineer shrugged. Who is John Galt? He means, said the fireman, don't ask questions nobody can answer. She looked at the red light and at the rail that went off into the black, untouched distance. She said, Proceed with caution to the next signal. If it's in order, proceed to the main track, then stop at the first open office. Yeah, who says so? I do. Who are you? It was only the briefest pause, a moment of astonishment at a question she had not expected. But the engineer looked more closely at her face, and in time with her answer he gasped, Good God! She answered, not offensively, merely like a person who does not hear the question often. Dagny Taggart. Well, I'll be, said the fireman and then they all remained silent. She went on in the same tone of unstressed authority. Proceed to the main track and hold the train for me at the first open office. Yes, Miss Taggart, you'll have to make up time. You've got the rest of the night to do it. Get the comet in on schedule. Yes, Miss Taggart. She was turning to go when the engineer asked, If there's any trouble, are you taking the responsibility for it, Miss Taggart? I am. The conductor followed her as she walked back to her car. He was saying, bewildered, But, just a seat in a day coach, Miss Taggart. But how come? But why didn't you let us know? She smiled easily. Had no time to be formal. Had my own car attached to number 22 out of Chicago, but got off at Cleveland. And number 22 was running late, so I let the car go. The comet came next, and I took it. There was no sleeping car space left. The conductor shook his head. Your brother, he wouldn't have taken a coach. She laughed. No, he wouldn't have. The men by the engine watched her walking away. The young brakeman was among them. He asked, pointing after her, Who is that? That's who runs Taggart Transcontinental, said the engineer. The respect in his voice was genuine. That's the vice president in charge of operation. When the train jolted forward, the blast of its whistle dying over the fields, she sat by the window lighting another cigarette. She thought, it's cracking to pieces like this all over the country.
You can expect it anywhere at any moment. But she felt no anger or anxiety. She had no time to feel. This would be just one more issue to be settled along with the others. She knew that the superintendent of the Ohio Division was no good, and that he was a friend of James Taggart. She had not insisted on throwing him out long ago, only because she had no better man to put in his place. Good men were so strangely hard to find. But she would have to get rid of him, she thought. And she would give his post to Owen Kellogg, the young engineer who was doing a brilliant job as one of the assistants to the manager of the Taggart Terminal in New York. It was Owen Kellogg who ran the terminal. She had watched his work for some time. She had always looked for sparks of competence, like a diamond prospector in an uncompromising wasteland. Kellogg was still too young to be made superintendent of a division. She had wanted to give him another year, but there was no time to wait. She would have to speak to him as soon as she returned. The strip of earth, faintly visible outside the window, was running faster now, blending into a gray stream. Through the dry phrases of calculations in her mind, she noticed that she did have time to feel something. It was the hard, exhilarating pleasure of action. With the first whistling rush of air as the comet plunged into the tunnels of the Taggart Terminal under the city of New York, Dagny Taggart sat up straight. She always felt it when the train went underground, the sense of eagerness, of hope, and of secret excitement. It was as if normal existence were a photograph of shapeless things in badly printed colors. But this was a sketch done in a few sharp strokes that made things seem clean, important, and worth doing. She watched the tunnels as they flowed past, bare walls of concrete, a net of pipes and wires, a web of rails that went off into black holes where green and red lights hung as distant drops of color. There was nothing else, nothing to dilute it, so that one could admire naked purpose and the ingenuity that had achieved it. She thought of the Taggart building standing above her head at this moment, growing straight to the sky, and she thought, these are the roots of the building, hollow roots twisting under the ground, feeding the city. When the train stopped, when she got off and heard the concrete of the platform under her heels, she felt light, lifted, impelled to action. She started off walking fast, as if the speed of her steps could give form to the things she felt. It was a few moments before she realized that she was whistling a piece of music, and that it was the theme of Halley's fifth concerto. She felt someone looking at her and turned. The young brakeman stood watching her tensely. She sat on the arm of the big chair facing James Taggart's desk, her coat thrown open over a wrinkled traveling suit. Eddie Willer sat across the room making notes once in a while. His title was that of special assistant to the vice president in charge of operation, and his main duty was to be her bodyguard against any waste of time. She asked him to be present at interviews of this nature, because then she never had to explain anything to him afterwards. James Taggart sat at his desk, his head drawn into his shoulders. The Rio Norte line is a pile of junk from one end to the other, she said. It's much worse than I thought, but we're going to save it. Of course, said James Taggart. Some of the rail can be salvaged, not much and not for long. We'll start laying new rail in the mountain sections, Colorado first. We'll get the new rail in two months. Oh, did Oren Boyle say he'll... I've ordered the rail from Reardon Steel. The slight choked sound from Eddie Willers was his suppressed desire to cheer. James Taggart did not answer at once. Dagny... Why don't you sit in the chair as one is supposed to, he said at last. His voice was petulant. Nobody holds business conferences this way. I do. She waited. He asked, his eyes avoiding hers. Did you say that you have ordered the rail from Reardon? Yesterday evening. I phoned him from Cleveland. But the board hasn't authorized it. I haven't authorized it. You haven't consulted me. She reached over, picked up the receiver of a telephone on his desk, and handed it to him. Call Reardon and cancel it, she said. James Taggart moved back in his chair. I haven't said that, he answered angrily. I haven't said that at all. Then it stands. I haven't said that either. She turned. 